God after Mittag. Jag preta inte svenska. And, and also, I've never been so wired in my life for sound uh, and vision. And I've been told to stand right behind this lectern so that I'm in the camera shot. Um, so apologies if I, feel, if I seem slightly immobile. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, it is outstanding to be here in Stavanger. Stavanger is a place I've never been to before. I did have the chance to walk around a little bit the city yesterday, and I found it a very interesting and pleasant place to be. It is twinned with a city in England called Harlow. Anyone been to Harlow? Has anyone been there? No? Harlow in Essex. Harlow is not far from where I live myself. It's, I don't live there, but it's not too far away. Um, it was described a couple of years ago as one of Britain's worst places to live. <laughs> Having been to Harlow, I can understand why that might be. Uh, I also wanted initially to congratulate you on the work of MIF. Uh, I, I've not been associated with MIF in the past, but I have found out a little bit about it. I've spoken to some people about MIF, and I'm deeply impressed by this, the way in which you've gathered momentum, gathered size, and the fantastic work that you do here in Norway. Uh, there isn't every country in Europe that is blessed to have such a fantastic organization that supports and understands the reality of the state of Israel. And thank you for Kettle to Kettle. Is that the correct pronunciation? Thank you. Yes, thank you. I won't try and say it again. Um, Thank you so much for inviting me, and thank you also for making such smooth arrangements for my travel here from England. I've served in the British Army for 30 years, retired a few years back, and on several occasions I was fortunate enough to serve alongside members of the Norwegian Army, including when I was in Afghanistan. And whenever my, and, and, and I should also mention, I just had the real pleasure of meeting one of your number, Mike Peck. Um, is it Michael? Michael, sorry. Michael, I beg your pardon. Michael Peck, who, um, who also has uh, served with, as a member of the Norwegian Army with my regiment in the past. So it was great to speak to him about um, some old fr mutual friends. Um, but whenever my regiment finds itself alongside Norwegian or Danish troops, we immediately find that we've got something in common, because we are also Vikings. My, my regiment's nickname is the Vikings. Um, I don't know why quite, but it is. It's, it's partly because we come from East Anglia, from the eastern part of England, which was subject to a large number of Viking raids. Uh, and I think also that many of my soldiers long in the past, forefathers who met Anglo-Saxon ladies in East Anglia may have uh, been Vikings themselves. And uh, at every mess party in the officers' mess or the, the, among the soldiers or the senior NCOs, you always find Viking helmets being worn. Of course, um, Norway and Britain have a... Uh, a long history of fighting together. Not fighting against each other, but fighting on the same side. And during the 62 days in 1940, in which Norwegian and British troops fought side by side, resisting the Nazi invasion of your country, unfortunately without success. And then many Norwegians fought the Nazis alongside British forces based out of Britain, including those that were able to escape from here after the Nazi victory, especially the Navy and the Air Force. But there were also many soldiers, many Norwegian soldiers, who fought uh, against the Nazis from Britain, including a very interesting unit called the 10th Inter-Allied Commando, which had a specific Norwegian unit within it 
uh, which was involved in special forces operations in various parts of Europe. And interestingly, um, there was also a specific Jewish troop among that commando, separate Jewish troop which fought as well, number three troop. Um, and in Stavanger yesterday, I was reminded of a bit of an earlier period, which I alluded to a, just a moment ago, before the Second World War, of, shall we say, shared military experience between British and Norwegians. I saw it on one of the roundabouts on the roads in Stavanger two iron cut-out Viking longships. And that reminded me, again, of my own home, because I live, I come from a town called Malden in Essex, which is not too far from Harlow, which I mentioned earlier, but it's not as bad as Harlow. Um, and you may or may not know that there was a very famous battle fought at Malden almost exactly 1,025 years ago in the year 991 when uh, a Viking raiding party led by the Norwegian king, Olaf Tryggvason, that may be the wrong pronunciation, but it's something like that. He led a raid into Britain, and they landed on an island called Northy Island, which is at, in Malden, where, where I come from. Um, and Nor Northy Island is connected to the mainland by a short causeway or road, which floods when the tide is up. Uh, and the only way to get from there on foot to the mainland is along this thin strip. And so the Vikings, under the king of Norway, tried to cross the road, but he got stopped by just a few Anglo-Saxon warriors who were firing arrows, throwing spears, and stopped them from coming. And the, the Viking demanded, the Viking king demanded that the, uh, the British leader, who was called Brithnoth, should stand aside and let his force come up the road so there could be a fair fight on the mainland. And King Brithnoth, or Brith Lord Brithnoth, agreed. <laughs> so his men stood aside. The Vikings advanced up the road. The British formed a shield line on the mainland. The Vikings attacked, and the Vikings defeated the British, the Anglo-Saxons. And that was a major victory, because it then led to the King of England, King Ethelred, agreeing to pay um, something like 10,000 Roman pounds to the Vikings, rather than carry on the fight. So. It, the idea was to stop these raids taking place by giving them what we call Danegeld, although they were Norwegians. Um, now, th that, that, that place I know like the back of my hand, it is, it is right next to where I live. I don't hold it against you. <laughs> the only reason I mention it is because um, it's, a, it's a great example of... Um, fighting fairly, how to fight fairly. Um, it's perhaps a foolish example because things would, could have been very different if Brithnoth had not st stood aside. But it is an example of fair play. And moving on to the main subject that I want to speak about, which is Israel, how it fights, and how that compares to other Western armies. Israel, the Israelis, the Jews actually, before the state of Israel was formed, were taught how not to fight fairly, how to fight unfairly, by a British Christian officer by the name of Ord Wingate, who you may possibly have heard of, who was a British intelligence officer, a captain, a Christian, who was posted to Palestine in the 1930s, and who taught the Jewish farmers how 
not just to wait until the Arabs attacked them, because the Arabs at that time, back in the 30s, were trying to drive the Jews into the sea even then, and they've not stopped that since. He, he taught them not to wait till they were attacked, but to go out and get the Arabs, to be unfair about it, to fight at night. Incidentally, I was last week I was in Israel, and I visited a thing called the Wingate Institute, which is a sporting center, um, university, which is actually in a city, the city of Netanya, which also coincidentally is twinned with Stavanger. Um, so Wingate, Wingate taught the Israelis how to fight, and, and in fact, or for, taught the Jewish farmers how, how they should fight. And in fact, David Ben-Gurion, who was around at the time, who uh, was, knew Wingate well, he said that had Wingate not been killed in the Second World War, he would have been the first chief of staff of the IDF when it was founded, which would have been interesting to have a, a British Christian commander of the Israeli forces in 1948. Um, not only did Wingate teach the Jews how to fight unfairly, but he also taught them how to fight morally. He taught them to hit hard, but he taught them to focus on the fighters and not on the civilian population, which was a more common way of fighting in that region in those days. So he gave, I think, Many people who eventually became the IDF uh, some years later, he gave them, instilled them with the kind of morality that has been developed by the IDF over the years. So it, but, and it is right, I think, that a civilized army such as yours, such as my own, such as the Israel Defense Force, should fight according to the laws of war should focus on the enemy and try and stop the death of innocent civilians. The question is, does Israel still do that today? Does Israel still fight fairly? I, I beg your pardon. Does Israel still fight according to the laws of war today? Prime Minister Netanyahu, when he spoke on Thursday just gone at the United Nations General Assembly, reminded us that the General Assembly had passed 20 resolutions against Israel last year, compared to just three against every other planet on Earth. Should this, perhaps, give us cause to wonder if there is legitimate criticism of Israel's human rights, of observation of human rights, of Israel's humanity? Netanyahu also spoke about the UN Human Rights Council, I gave evidence to the Human Rights Council. In fact, he referred to them as a joke. I gave evidence to the Human Rights Council investigation into the last Gaza conflict in 2014. I went to Geneva to speak to the chairman. And I've spoken at two emergency sessions of the council debating that conflict uh, and the 2008-09 conflict, Operation Cast Lead. You probably recall the Goldstone Report looking into that conflict. After both conflicts in Gaza, the Human Rights Council condemned Israel for committing war crimes and crimes against humanity in assaults against the Palestinian civilian population. Is this true? Ladies and gentlemen, I was present during the last two conflicts in Gaza. I can tell you with 100% certainty, as a professional infantry officer in the British Army who has spent my, most of my life fighting against terrorism, against insurgency, against the kind of enemy that Israel was fighting in Gaza, I can tell you with absolute certainty that the findings of the Human Rights Council were not just wrong, they were 180 degrees they were diametrically the opposite of the reality. It is that serious. I met with many of those involved in the conflicts, from the Prime Minister right the way down 
to the private soldiers fighting hand-to-hand -hand sometimes on the ground in Gaza, including, I think, at least one Norwegian IDF soldier who I met out there. I experienced both the fighting effectiveness of the IDF, the, co the battle spirit, and also the humanity of the IDF in action. I told the UN Human Rights Council that no army in history had ever made such profound efforts to avoid the loss of life of innocent civilians as the IDF had done in Gaza in all three of those conflicts. I don't need to go through every step that they took because I'm sure you're fairly familiar with the measures the IDF took to deal with their enemy in Gaza. But if you wish, when we come to question time afterwards, I'm happy to expand on that. But I just want to, just, I just want to illustrate to you the humanity of the IDF by giving you two examples from my personal experience. The first one, I visited a, an Air Force base just on the border of Gaza, an Israeli Air Force base. <clears throat> and I spoke to a pilot, actually he was a Scottish pilot, um, a Scottish pilot in the IDF, who could just have well been in the Royal Air Force the way he behaved and was. And, I, and he told me what he was doing that morning. He'd been flying attack missions into Gaza all morning. And they'd attempted to destroy a specific target in Gaza, which was a high-value target, and he said he flew something like 10, 12 sorties against that target. And each time he had to abort the mission, he couldn't attack because there were civilians in the target area. And eventually they called off the mission because there were always civilians there. And I said to him, you must find that very frustrating. And he said to me, it wasn't at all frustrating. He said the greatest thing about the Israel Defense Force is that they will not allow you to attack and kill innocent civilians. They don't want you to do that unless it can't be avoided. And he said, as a pilot, as a combat pilot, that, that, that's exactly what I want as well. He said, he said, I'm a father. I'm a husband. How could I live with myself? How could I set an example to my children? How could I go home to my wife if that day I'd been out from the air, deliberately slaughtering innocent women and children on the ground. That is the morality that you're faced with if you speak to IDF soldiers. I spoke a day or so later to a young 19-year-old IDF engineer whose job was to go down into the tunnels in Gaza, clear the tunnels before they were then destroyed by the IDF. And he told me you know, he was going down, abseiling down into the tunnels in darkness, he could face anything. He could face snipers, bombs, ambush, machine guns, mines, suicide bombers, or human shields, which were all used in those tunnels against the Israelis. And he said, when I'm going down there, he was telling me this, he'd just come back, literally he was covered in dirt from just coming back. He said, when I go down into those tunnels, at the forefront of my mind, as I'm advancing down the tunnel with my rifle in my hand, is I do not want to kill a civilian. I must avoid killing. If I, you know, I've got to be aware of the human shields. That is an eight, a 19-year-old young man, undoubtedly scared stiff for his own life, descending into the unknown, into all form of peril. And at the forefront of his mind is the need not to kill innocent civilians. I give you those two examples of the true humanity of the IDF. This is the result of a number of things. First of all, the nature of Israeli society. By the way, I should point out to you that that 19-year-old young man was killed the next day clearing a tunnel. This is the result of Israeli society, the morality of Israeli society, and also of the IDF's military training. It starts at the top during that conflict, every day, or several times a day sometimes, the Prime Minister chaired the Security Council. The first item on the agenda of their Security Council meetings was always Palestinian civilian casualties. That was the priority. That, 
illustrates to you how important it was as a priority to Israel, to the Prime Minister, and to the IDF, who he directed to avoid, where he possibly could, civilian casualties. So why is Israel's military conduct seen so differently from uh, that of other Western armies? The Norwegian army, I'm sure, doesn't get the accusations the IDF gets. The British army doesn't. Yes, the American army doesn't. We get criticized. We don't get anything like the extent of abuse, criticism, and lies that are hurled at the IDF. There are, of course, some fundamental differences between the IDF operations and our own. I'm going to speak a bit more about some of our own operations in a moment. And I'm, by our own, I mean collectively, the, the Western armies. First of all, the differences. The, um, for Israel, their conflicts are an immediate existential threat. There is no distance between Israel and Gaza. It's right on their doorstep, threatening them, threatening to kill their civilian population. And from Norway to Helmand in Afghanistan or to Kabul is 8,000 kilometers. Yes, the jihadists present a threat from as far away as Afghanistan and other places, but it's not the same immediacy. So Israel has to deal with it with a different type of priority and urgency. We, we, we can take more risks when we decide we need to attack an enemy. We don't need to attack an enemy if it's going to potentially cause many civilian casualties or even some. We sometimes might do that, and we do it, but we, don't, we, 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 we have a greater luxury in time. The Israelis don't have that luxury, and they therefore sometimes do have to attack targets in which civilians die. One, thing I should, one point I should make to you, which I'm sure you're well aware of, is the miracle of the Iron Dome, the Iron Dome um, rocket defense system, which uh, is a combination of Israeli technology and American funding, which has protected Israel from the worst rocket attacks from Gaza. If it wasn't for that system, the Iron Dome, far, far more civilians would have had to be killed in Gaza because rockets would have been landing in among the Israeli civilian population and killing people in large numbers if the Iron Dome hadn't stopped it. So the Iron Dome allowed Israel to an extent the same kind of luxuries we have when we're calculating what to do about something 8,000 miles away in Afghanistan. So the Iron Dome not just saved the lives of innocent Israeli civilians, it also saved the lives of innocent Palestinian civilians as well. Israel has far superior intelligence on what's going on in Gaza than we ever have done in Afghanistan. There's a simple reason for that. Because Israel has been living with the Gaza problem in one form or another since even before the formation of the State of Israel. It's a small area, predictable. Their intelligence services can get good coverage. No intelligence is perfect, but they can get good coverage. That makes a huge difference to the way in which one can operate. But I think a, a really fundamental difference, the really fundamental difference in the, the two Western armies and Israel is the extent to which Israel is subjected to hostile propaganda. Put bluntly, Israel and the IDF have been subjected and are still subjected to the greatest slur campaign in the history of the world. It's been going on for many years and it has become increasingly effective, far more effective than any propaganda that could be thrown at the Norwegian army or the British army. Israel is also viewed so often in isolation from other NATO armies. When we fight, we fight with you. When America fights, it fights with us, with you, with Canada, with France. France? Is anyone French here? Okay. Um, I have to be careful what I say about the French because this is being recorded. 
and we're very good friends with the French. Um, officially, yes. Um, but Israel is viewed in isolation, always in isolation. It's always looked at on its own, and therefore there's nothing really to compare it with. Now, partly to redress that balance, I and a number of other people conducted a study into comparative conflicts, a sort, similar sort of things to what the Israelis have been fighting. Not exactly the same, because nothing is, but similar sort of things. And we did a series of case studies, and with me there were... Um, 13 generals from nine different countries around the world, including France, yep, yeah, France, including uh, Australia, India, um, Germany, Italy, and a number of other, and America, and a number of other countries. And we looked at a series of, uh, of conflicts that have been going on, and we came up with a number of points. I'm just going to go briefly through some of those points because they are relevant to what we're talking about now, and they do point to some of the issues to do with Israel. And we, we, we've uh, basically focused on a number of threats that our forces f are faced with today, new threats. First one is the, the political warfare strategy of our terrorist and insurgent enemies. And the political warfare is their main weapon because obviously very few of these insurgents, including Hamas in Gaza, can actually take on something like the Israeli Defense Force and hope to win. So their, their victory has got to be achieved through uh, political warfare, propaganda, uh, and influence of um, major international organizations like the United Nations, the EU, and our own countries. Secondly, they fight with utter disregard for the laws of war or human rights. Utter and total disregard. They don't ignore the laws of war. They study how we follow the laws of war and then exploit our adherence to them. They don't just exploit events when our forces kill innocent civilians, which unfortunately they sometimes have to do, but they do all they can, all they can, to compel us to kill innocent civilians. And that's what happened in Gaza. Hamas did everything to force the Israelis to kill their civilians. They made sure that their weapon systems were located in among civilian population. They made sure that when the civilians moved out of the area, perhaps warned by the IDF to go, they were forced back in. Two objectives are achieved. One, it could deter the Israelis from attacking, and therefore they live to fight another day. Or two, better, the Israelis attack and kill their civilians, and they can then bring opprobrium down onto the Israelis from the Director General of the United Nations, from Ban Ki-moon, who can stand tearfully accusing Israel of not doing enough to prevent innocent civilians, from our Prime Minister, from the President of the United States. Um, that is their ultimate goal. There's no question about it. I don't regard human shields as human shields. They are, in fact, used by Hamas. They're human sacrifices. They want them to die. And we found this similar characteristic among other jihadist groups that our armies have been fighting, although not refined to the same degree. They use media and human rights organizations to exploit and create political pressure against our governments. And as I mentioned before, it's particularly strong against Israel. And they often are able, through this, to seize strategic victory from the jaws of military defeat. In an era when political and military leadership in all of our countries is so sensitive to media pressure and so sensitive to human rights issues, it has the effect of severely constraining our forces' actions. And we found that this endangers our troops on the battlefield uh, when they should be following the laws of armed conflict, not human rights law, which cannot be applied, in my opinion, on the battlefield, and I'm happy to discuss that further if anyone wished to. And the end product of all that is it causes casualties, not just among our soldiers, but among civilians. Because the more that you allow groups like Hamas to benefit from human shields, the more that Ban Ki-moon stands condemning Israel because they've killed innocent civilians as a result of human shields, then the more they're going to use these human shields. It's going to increase the extent. Other jihadist groups have learned this lesson as well, and we've seen a significant upsurge in 
the, uh, the extent of human shield use. We found in every case we studied that the government forces concerned, including the Israeli forces and our own um, and other national armies, following, following military law and the laws of armed conflict as far as they possibly could to the letter. That's not to say that there were no mistakes. It's not to say that when a British attack takes place on an enemy target, civilians don't die, because either there are human shields there, we don't know about it, or we make a judgment to attack anyway because the target is so important, which is not illegal, necessarily. Or people make errors. A bomb goes in the wrong place. A missile, the most expensive guided missile that costs more than your car, probably more than my house, um, can miss the target and kill someone that it didn't intend to kill. Explosives do weird things. We have bad soldiers as well as good ones. Even in the British Army, we have bad soldiers. I know in the Norwegian Army, you don't have any bad soldiers. <laughs> but, um, and, but, you know, bad soldiers because they're either not strong enough mentally or they're crazy people. You, some, you know, you sometimes get crazed people out on the streets of Stavanger, I'm sure. Possibly not Stavanger, possibly Oslo, I don't know. But you certainly get crazy civilians all over the place. You, and some of them become soldiers. And some of them are crazy people with guns. So not many, but you do get that. So we do have things going wrong. And we found that with all the armies, where things go wrong, they are investigated in great detail and where necessary, people brought to justice. And that applies nowhere more than in the IDF. I've spent a great deal of time sitting down with the judge advocate, with the, um, the senior military lawyer in the uh, IDF and going through his and his staff's explanations as to how they deal with it. I would, I would actually challenge any army to come up with a more effective means of investigating and then bringing to justice when necessary allegations of war crimes than you find in Israel. As I mentioned, we find the common theme among our enemies of ignoring the laws of armed conflict fighting from the civilian population, using protected objectives for military purposes, and in, in Gaza, as in Afghanistan, as elsewhere, they store weapons in mosques, they use ambulances to move their fighters and their commanders from one place to the other, they use hospitals as headquarters. These are places that we don't want to attack, but we sometimes have to if they use for military purposes. I just want to move on now briefly because I'm conscious of the time. I know we're running late as well, but um, I think um, the final couple of points to make about the, this, this group that did the investigation I spoke about. I'd mentioned there were 13 generals from nine countries. Not one of them, I was probably the only one among them, and I'm not a general, I'm a humble colonel, very, very low down the ranks. Not one of them apart from perhaps me, uh, had previous significant experience in relation to Israel. Not one of them was biased in favor of Israel or could be influenced. They were all honorable, professional, distinguished military men. Some of them went there with doubts about what they would find and perhaps were concerned about the fact they would find, um, they would uncover things that they wouldn't have done themselves that the IDF had done, because they listen to the media like everybody else does. They listen to what, for example, the BBC has to say about Israel and the IDF. They all came away, they all came away after the time we spent in Israel with the opinion that their own armies could not achieve the same kind of military success and the same amount of care for the lives of innocent civilians as the IDF achieved. They all came away with that view. And they all came away concerned that Israel was setting too high a bar that Israel was able to achieve that their own armies in a similar situation may not be able to achieve. Which actually is quite an admission. 
And we're talking about representation from most Western armies and some non-Western democratic armies. And, and it's not just their opinion. I don't know if you know of General, Samart or not, sir, General Martin Dempsey, who was the last senior American soldier in the US, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who said that, uh, that America had lessons to learn from Israel's operations in Gaza. And he sent out a team to learn those lessons and apply them to his own operations uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. I, um, I just want to leave you with two thoughts before I finish. And I'm happy to expand on any of this in questions. Um, the first thing is, I want to highlight the difference between Hamas and the IDF. And I know nobody here has any delusion about moral equivalence between the two organizations. <clears throat> but, but many people do. I, I went down in 2014 during the last conflict in Gaza. I went down into one of the tunnels that runs under the border with Israel. And it started, I think, a kilometer or so into Gaza. It came under the border and came up next to a kibbutz <clears throat> in Israel. The tunnel hadn't been completed when it was discovered. So it didn't come up, it came up just close to the kibbutz, but the Israelis worked out that the tunnel trajectory would have taken it through and into the kibbutz with the idea of coming up inside the kibbutz, in the center of it. No doubt with the intention of sending perhaps 30, 50, 100 fighters down the tunnel at night into the kibbutz, murdering dozens of Israeli civilians asleep in their beds capturing some and taking them back for goodness knows what purpose into Gaza. You can imagine the consequences of that. That was the intention. I went into the tunnel. It was quite extraordinary, actually. The, it was concrete constructed. The floor was concrete. The walls were concrete. The roof was concrete. Beautifully made, beautifully laid, poured concrete. Very, very effective construction. I think even Stavanger Airport would be proud of it. Railway lines running down the floor, lights overhead, air conditioning, um, electric motors built into the wall. I pulled out one of the cables, and written on the cable was words in Hebrew. Um, this was an amazing construction, but just one of, and you didn't, you didn't have to crouch in the tunnel, you could walk down, it was big just one of a massive complex of tunnel systems under Gaza and through the borders with Egypt and with Israel. And something troubled me about that tunnel. Something troubled me about the tunnel. And I couldn't work out what it was. And then I remembered. It then occurred to me what, what, was be, what was nagging in my mind. Earlier that year, in 2014, at the beginning of 2014, I had been to visit Auschwitz. And immediately I saw the comparison. Very, very different scale. Very, very different scale. But both of those constructions were superbly built. The result of massive bureaucratic planning, investment of enormous resources, skilled workmanship went into both of those constructions. Superbly planned. Both of them, Auschwitz and the attack tunnels under Gaza, with one purpose, the massacre of Jews. And that should not surprise anybody. Because Hamas is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Muslim Brotherhood owes its doctrine and its origins to the Nazis. Because the, one of the earlier leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood, who was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, spent the war in Nazi Germany, met with Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler and other leading Nazis, and himself persuaded the Nazis that if they succeeded in conquering North Africa and the Middle East, they would institute the final solution of the Jewish problem in the Middle East as they had done in Europe. None of this is any surprise to people who understand the history that there should be such a comparison between the objectives and the techniques of the Nazis and those of Hamas. The opposite side of the coin is the IDF. I, I believe, I, I was a British soldier for 30 years, I fought 
with the British, with the Americans, as I mentioned, with the Norwegians, with other armies. And I don't believe any army in the world has superior morality to the IDF, from my experience. I include the British Army in that. I'm not in any way questioning your army's morality or mine, but I don't believe that they exceed those of the IDF. And in, in many cases, I believe the IDF's morality exceeds those of most other armies. And why is that? I would point to two reasons. The first one is the fact that, unlike the British Army, the IDF are conscripts. If you join the British Army, you join the Army for one reason. You don't join because you want to do some knitting or collect stamps or look at train numbers as they go across. You join the British Army because you want to fight. You want to fight. You're a tough guy. You probably come from a tough neighborhood where you fought quite a lot of your life. You want to fight. Well, you wouldn't join the Army if you didn't want to fight, not as an infantryman, not as a tank man or an artillery gunner, certainly. That's not why people join the IDF. Some do, yes, a small number. Most join because they have to, because the law says they have to. Most of them want to be plumbers. Most of them want to be computer technicians. They want to be builders. They want to be drivers. They want to do a thousand and one other jobs such as most of you are doing. They don't join because they want to fight. That gives a different mentality, a less gung-ho mentality, perhaps a more restrained mentality. It doesn't affect their fighting effectiveness, but I think it does affect their morality because it's not what they're there for. They're not there because they want to fight. They're there because they have to fight. And the second reason, I think, is, and I'm not saying this as a Jew because I'm not Jewish. I'm, I'm, a, I'm um, a Roman Catholic. And actually, I'm, I'm a fundamentalist Roman Catholic. Um, extremist, perhaps. But uh, I... Um, I believe that the other reason is the religion of Judaism. Because I think, from my experience in Israel, that Judaism permeates the whole society in Israel in a way that Christianity does not permeate society in Britain today, as it used to many years ago. It doesn't today. I know that majority of Israelis are not practicing Jews, but still, from what I've seen of that society, Judaism still is a huge influence and it's a huge influence throughout the IDF, even among those people who aren't Jews. And I believe that that brings an added morality to the IDF, an added humanity as well. Ron Derma, who's the Israeli ambassador to the United States of America, I was at an event with him recently when he said that the IDF deserves the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, I think he's probably right there. I, I, somehow I doubt they're going to get it but I think they do deserve it. I want to conclude just with the words of Golda Meir, who I think, I think these words sum up morality and humanity of not just Israel, but of the IDF. And she said, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these words, she said, we can forgive the Arabs for killing our children. We cannot forgive them for forcing us to kill their children. Tuss Tuck. <laughs>